The story is told that one day, Lou Gehrig, the famous New York Yankee, first baseman came to plate. There were two outs, and it was the ninth inning, and the potentiality of winning runs on the second and the third base. The count against Gehrig was a full count, three balls and two strikes. The pitcher will round up, and he let the ball go. It was a fast ball. Came smoking right over the middle of the plate. And Gehrig didn't swing the bat. The umpire screamed out, strike three, game over. And very slowly, Lou Gehrig turned and he spoke to the umpire. Now at that, the crowd went wild because Lou Gehrig never said anything to the umpire. So as soon as the game was over, the reporters rushed over to the umpire and asked the umpire, what was it that Lou Gehrig said? The umpire let out a smile. And he said, Lou, come over here and tell them what you said to me. And Lou Gehrig said, all I did was whisper in his ear, Mr. Ump, I would give $10 to have that one back. Now, who among us would not give $10 or even $10,000 to have one moment of life back that we regret? Things we said or things we did or things we left unsaid or undone that we wish we could have a do-over about. That's what feelings of regret are all about. Looking back over life and thinking about the things that we have done and the things we have left undone. You can hear me better with the mask on, can't you? No? Yes? <laughs> we'll try it this way for a while. Is that better? No. Now it's better. Better than the mask? Okay. It's a regret, right? Oh my gosh. I, I did something that now I'm embarrassed about. I left my mask on when I should have taken it off. I take it off when I should leave it on. Sometimes our regrets are about small things like that. But sometimes our regrets are over major things in our lives. The regrets I'm talking about are not the kind of regrets that we have when we have that second brownie and we feel bad that we ate it when it's not on our diet. I'm talking about those regrets that keep you up at night, those regrets that disturb you and disturb your spirit. And they usually come to us with those phrases, if only. If only I'd taken my education more seriously and done my homework. If only I'd talked to my dad and told him I was sorry before he died. If only I'd taken that other job. If only you fill in the blank. What are your if onlys? Whether it's over the road not taken or over the road that you stayed on too long, part of the human experience is that we have regrets. Regrets in life about things we have done and things we have left undone. As a pastor, I can tell you that I find one of the things that I talk to people about most often is the regrets that they have in life. The things that they can't seem to let go of. Webster's Dictionary defines regret as sorrow aroused by circumstances beyond one's control and power to repair. We want a do-over. But regret is that sorrow or that remorse that we feel in the past of what has happened that we can't seem to fix on our own. As you replay these events in your mind, you may be like me. And your mind 
just keep saying to you over and over again, well, I shoulda, I coulda, I woulda, I oughta, all those things that you wish you had done differently, but you didn't. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Regrets. I've had a few. And if you want to get beyond that shoulda, woulda, coulda life, then somehow we have to learn how to deal with those regrets, how to resolve them and move past our past to experience a clean set slate so that we can enjoy the abundant life that Jesus came to bring to us. Because you see, our present is inextricably linked to our past. If we're weighed down by regret from our past, it's hard for us to experience joy in the present. It's hard for us to fully embrace each day that is given to us if we're perpetually looking back over our shoulder to see if our past is catching up to us. Now don't just take my word for it. This has been scientifically proved that unfinished business takes on a life of its own because our brain remembers incomplete tasks much more than our brain remembers tasks that we have completed. And a regret is something that we have not resolved yet. We haven't brought closure to yet. And so our brain keeps holding on to it, trying to resolve that past issue so that the case can be closed. It's known as the Zigernick effect. The Zigernick effect. When a project is completed, the brain files that project away somewhere in the recesses of your memory, and it doesn't pop out and keep you up at night. But when a project has not been completed, when a task has not been done to your satisfaction, your brain keeps that file open, reminding you that you need to do something with that. And regrets have no closure. If you and I don't take the necessary steps to bring closure to that unfinished business of our past, then just like Ebenezer Scrooge, we'll hear the ghost of our past rattling those chains, disturbing us day after day with their ghoulish voices haunting us and taunting us until we take seriously the remembering and the redeeming of our past. Now, I don't know what unfinished business you have in your past. I don't know what your regrets are. But I do know this. I know that they weigh us down and they drag us down. And we have many ways that we try to deal with our regrets, don't we? We might try to medicate them away, but that never works. We might try to avoid those painful memories, avoid going back to the places or running into the people that we have unfinished business with. But whatever is troubling our mind will wake us up at night. As we get into bed and we turn out the light, our brain will say things to us like, I should have never let that happen. Why was I so selfish? Why did I let that happen? I should have, I could have, I would have, if only. You see, the problem is, many of us don't realize that we have a choice about whether or not we hold on to those regrets or let them go. So in the time that we have remaining, I want to lift up for us a biblical model to help us let go of those past regrets. And the first step is one that we hear in the church quite often. It's that we need to address that regret, that sin, that hurt, that pain that we brought into the world. We need to name it and we need to ask forgiveness for it. The singer-songwriter Bono made this observation, and I quote him. He said, 
At the center of all religions is the idea that what you put out comes back to you. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Or in physics, every action is met by an equal or opposite one. And yet, along comes the idea of grace that upends all of that. Love interrupts, if you like, the consequences of your action, which in my case are a very good many indeed, because I've done a lot of stupid things. You see, God will forgive our sins, not because we deserve to be forgiven, or when we've done enough good to outweigh the bad. He forgives freely, just because He loves us. When we have courage enough to name that sin, that broken part, that way we have caused hurt and pain in this world, God freely forgives us of that sin. There's an old story that brought this to home in my heart. It's an old story about a little boy who was visiting grandparents on their farm. And his grandfather gave to him a slingshot to play with in the backyard, and he set up some targets in the backyard. The little boy tried as hard as he could to hit those targets, but he never was able to hit the targets. His aim was off every time. Discouraged, he starts to walk back towards the farmhouse. He realized it was about time for lunch. And as he's walking back to the farmhouse, he sees his grandmother's pet duck sitting in the yard. And for some odd reason, he just pulled another rock out of his pocket and he put in that slingshot and he aimed it towards grandma's pet duck. He couldn't believe it. When he aimed it at the duck, he hit the duck and killed the poor bird. He was so overcome with grief and regret, he didn't know what to do. He took that duck and he hid the duck in the wood pile, piled up some wood around it so that Grandma wouldn't know. And as he's putting that last log on top of the place where he laid the duck, he realizes his sister Sally has seen the whole thing. So he walks into Grandma's house and he sits down at the table and he's just waiting on Sally to tell Grandma what he's done. But she never does. She keeps his secret. And at the end of lunch, Grandma says, Sally, I need you to help me wash the dishes. And Sally says, oh no, Grandma, Johnny said he likes washing dishes. He wants to stay in here and wash dishes with you today. And she leaned over to Johnny and she said, remember the duck? So Johnny washed the dishes. Later that evening, Grandpa said, you know, I'm thinking about going fishing tomorrow. I want to take both, both you kids with me fishing. How would y'all like that? Sally piped up and she said, oh, Grandpa, I'd love to go, but Johnny can't. Johnny said he wants to stay here and help Grandma clean the house. She leaned over to Johnny and she said, remember the duck? Well, this went on for several weeks. And Johnny ended up doing all of his chores and all of Sally's chores. And finally, he got tired of doing all of that, and he went to his grandma to confess what he had done and to ask for her forgiveness. And his grandma said, Oh, Johnny, I knew exactly what you'd done. You see, I was standing at the kitchen window, and I saw the whole thing. And I was just wondering how long you would let Sally make you her slave. You see, that's what happens when we don't let go of regret, and confess it, and ask for forgiveness. That regret becomes a master of our lives, controls our actions, and keeps us from doing things that we want to do and experiencing joy in life. Winston Churchill said, if the present quarrels with the past, there could be no future. But God wants us to have a beautiful future. And once we have received that forgiveness from God, then we need to let it go and move on. 
And I know that's easier said than done. But there's another old story that I'd like to share with you. It's a story about a Kentucky farmer named Mr. Claypool. A storm blew through his property and did a lot of damage to his farm. One of the victims of the storm was an old pear tree that had been in his family for generations. Mr. Claypool was deeply grieved over the loss of that tree and the fruit. He had climbed that tree as a boy. He had wonderful special memories of that pear tree. A neighbor went over to Mr. Claypool's house to help him clean up the debris, and the neighbor said, Mr. Claypool, I'm so sorry that that storm blew down your beautiful pear tree. What on earth will you do? And Mr. Claypool responded, Well, I'm sorry too. That tree was an important part of my past, but I'm going to pick the fruit that's left on it, and then I'm going to burn what's left. Now, what Mr. Claypool said was literal about that tree, but I believe it was also figurative for us. We need to pick the fruit from that brokenness in our past, the fruit of the lessons that we can learn so that we can live a better way of life, and then we need to move forward, letting the rest just be burned away. We need to move forward with that wisdom under our belts. That's what the Apostle Paul means in the text that we read today from his letter to the church in Philippi when he said, This one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul had a lot in his past that he needed to let go of. But he knew that Jesus had turned him from a murderer to a minister. He knew the power of Christ's forgiveness at work in his life. In the text that we read about Peter today, Peter too understood that gift of forgiveness. You see, Peter denied his Lord three times. Even when he said, I'll never do it, he did it. But after... Christ rose from the grave. Christ meets Peter again on the seashore. He meets him again by an open fire. Just as he had been by that open fire denying Jesus, Jesus meets him by an open fire cooking fish on the beach. And Jesus asked Peter three times, Do you love me? And each time Peter says, You know I love you. Now by the third time Jesus asked, do you love me? I can see that Peter must be feeling pretty antsy. I've already answered you twice. You know I love you. Why are you asking me again? Are you wanting to make me feel so guilty about denying you before? But that's not really what Jesus was doing. Jesus was giving to Peter a new tape to play in his mind whenever he saw an open fire. Instead of remembering that he stood by an open fire and denied Jesus, instead of remembering that open fire as a place of regret, he can now remember that open fire as a place where he told Jesus that he loved him and that Jesus forgave him and gave him a new start in life and said, I still have work for you to do. I know what you've done in the past, but I forgive you. And I still want you to be part of my family and to move forward with me. Now, my dear friends, getting off that guilt trip, getting rid of regret is not easy, I know. But one of the most quoted verses in the Bible is John 3.16. But we need to hear the verse that follows, verse 17. For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. My dear friends, that is the good news of the gospel. May we have the courage and the strength to admit where we have fallen short, 
and receive this gift of forgiveness and new life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may it be so.